It is the road. Of, it is the Bet Spurts Masters PGA DFS show. I have been doing a million different shows. As you can tell, I'm pretty strung out. It's the Byron show over here on the Bet Spurts Golf YouTube channel. Ron, I don't typically get that excited about an intro, but that intro got me jacked up. Those green jackets, they do something to me. Happy Masters Week. Uh, this is the best major by far. You know, we get the entire band. Live PJ Tour finally back together again, and um, you know just to have every Man single, back. every single elite player in the world here on this course. Um, love Augusta National, so gonna be a blast to watch. We got a little weather coming in tomorrow, so a little tricky to see how that all plays out with you know any weather edges. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm just looking forward to tomorrow. Just finally getting here. I know it's going to be interesting to see how many hours of golf we get tomorrow. Unfortunately, that's how it is going to be. I may land up not even taking the day off because I'm not going to burn a day to sit around and watch reruns of 2019 as much as we all love that. But the weather's going to provide us with some distinct, distinguishing decisions to make this week, Ron. I'll go ahead and tell you what I'll be doing from a strategy perspective, from a stacking perspective going into the Masters. Since it's only 89 guys with about call it 80 of them, capable of really even sniffing contention with, what, 50 of them really only able to win this tournament. I'm out on the 150 this week. I'm going back to the single entries, you know, those big boy tournaments. I've even jumped into the Millie Makers, you know, at the $10 pops. I've got like four or five lineups in there out of the 150, taking my chance. It's the Masters week. You know, we preach contest selection, all that stuff. But if I can win a million dollars this week, I'll be very happy about that. So what are you doing, Ron, um, from a stacking perspective with the weather? Yeah, well, just looking at it, even compared to yesterday, it looks like the bad weather's clearing out, like even after noon, one o'clock tomorrow. So I think just initially it didn't look like we'd get much golf in, but I think um, we might get more than we thought. So, you know, definitely that first wave of guys should be able to, you know, get their rounds in. And, you know, you got wins kind of on both days. And so um, mm -hmm. it's just interesting to see, um, you know, if, if, Guys get to finish on a Saturday morning when it's less windy, you know, so that would kind of be the AM wave. But then, you know, you can look at it from the flip side with the PM wave getting an advantage if, you know, they get to go off and get a lot of golf in tomorrow. Um, so, yeah, it's just something that you're going to have to keep monitoring as the day goes on. Um, so, like you said, I think it's always smart to stack AM, PM and kind of, you know, kind of play both sides of it just in case. Yeah. So just to clarify, not to stack AM, PM, to stack both waves that go off in the AM and the PM, as well as just mixing them together. I said to you, Ron, I won't be paying too much attention to that since I'll be doing the single entry thing, but maybe, you know, like a quarter of my lineups are stacked to one side of the wave, a quarter of the other, and then maybe half of my singles kind of going to just wherever I feel like betting or playing this week, you know. So it's going to be a fun freaking week at the mall. Look at that background, Ron. Golly, man, that looks so good. Have you ever been to, you've never been to Augusta, have you? Not yet, not yet. One of these days for sure. Uh, I need to, we're making friends in the Gulf. How out of all people, you don't have the connections to get to Augusta, Ron? We need to organize that. I haven't, you know, I haven't tried. I haven't tried. It's been so busy with stuff around here, but um, yeah, hopefully, um, hopefully in the near future. Good. We'll get it figured out. When Cam Smith wins the Masters this week, I'll chat to him, reach out to him, and see if he can organize us to, to be out there for next year's defending championship run. We've got Scotty Scheffler sitting at 12-1, Ron. By the way, folks, before we get into the slate here, the rabbit hole and vivid picks, that partnership ends at the end of this month. Make sure you take advantage of that. It's only $5 for the rest of the year or a calendar year. Which one of those are we speaking about, Ron? Yeah, I think it's going to be the calendar year. The calendar year. Good. So that's even better deal than what I was speaking about. And it's, you know, available in the majority of states out there. So make sure you grab that. Use it for your benefit. The rabbit hole is amazing, especially when you're looking for nuanced filters, you know, across multiple platforms of the strokes gained world. You know, around the green, you can look up fringe proximity at Augusta played whenever you want you know, you can filter out random stuff wherever you need to. So there's tons and tons of amazing tools and tricks out there that you can use to get really, really nerdy. The stuff that I kind of really fancy. And 
it's just a, a fantastic product, Ron. Yeah, and even for this week, like there's specific little things, you know, no, no other site has where you can actually look at carry distance um, from however much of a time frame you want to analyze. You want to go back three years, five years. Um, if you want to look at scrambling just on difficult short grass courses, like here at the uh, Masters, everybody knows Augusta National is so difficult with all these tight lies, uneven lies around the green. Like you can, you can actually go and look at how other similar courses that are tough how other players um, have played on those courses. And so just so many different ways you can go back and look. And, and the big thing is we, we are one of the only uh, sites that has actual strokes gain masters data all the way back to 2019. So um, that's really interesting to kind of look at and analyze, you know, who's, who's doing what, you know, with, with a little bit more sample size to look at. Yeah. It's a fascinating situation. And we'll chat about that going into the slate here at 12 one run. We've got, Mr. Augusta himself, not necessarily the greatest course history if you actually take a look at it, but we've got Scotty Scheffler. We will be defending his 2021, 2022 Masters Green Jacket as John Rahm is this year's defending champion. Kind of backed myself into a corner with that one there a little bit. But Scotty's 12-1 run, the floor of the DFS slate this week is $6,000. So we've seen Scotty push the 13K mark a few times, but having $5,000 options really does help you there. This week, $6,000 floor, and those $6,000 options are Jose Maria, Alazabal, VJ Singh. It's it's barren, you know. So what are you doing with Scotty? I'm out, especially looking at my single, like I've always mentioned on these elevated events, Scotty Scheffler in these single entries is going to be very difficult for the optimal lineup to show up because I'm scared of the Scotty lineups in where there's half a million lineups. Someone is going to find the five other guys to match up with Scotty, you know, one way or another in 5,000. I would take my chances thinking that I can find a better balance build with a Brooks Kupka as my number one click than, you know, the other guys with the Scotty Scheffler situation. So let me know what your thoughts are on a $12,100 Scotty Scheffler, who I've got nothing bad to say about outside of his price tag and a third of the field potentially owning Scotty Scheffler this week. So before I get into him, let me just kind of from a broad overview of the slate. So I hate to put it so bluntly, but there's just not going to be many surprises at the Masters. So yes. as we all know, course history is so predictive here in the same guys who have played well will continue to do so. So you're not going to find many buried diamonds in the rough. Um, so for me, from a DFS perspective, it's going to be a matter of finding the right mix of these elite players like Scheffler, um, along with some of the other elite players who are not in good form, who are going to have lower ownership that we're going to get into. So I'm talking players like Cantlay, Homa, Hovland, Justin Thomas, Morikawa, even a Tom Kim, who's kind of very cheap this week. And so then you have the question of what about the players who have little to no experience? You know, you look at what Will Zalatoris did his first two trips here, you know, second place, sixth place. Uh, so can Wyndham Clark do that? What about an Bear? What about, you know, Thigala, who was ninth here in his only trip? And so for me, it's kind of finding that lower ownership and mixing and matching and, and trying to find those guys who are not in good form, who we know can still rise to the occasion. And so, you know, Going back to, to what you asked now with Scheffler, um, I mean, for me, he's a given, you know, I know some people like to get tricky and I'm not saying you're, you know, you're like overthinking it and, and not, not playing him as much, or I don't know if you're going to play him at all, but you know, I mean, look in his last four starts, he's gained 47.2 strokes T to green, which is one of the key things I'm looking for. You know, he's the second best player on the par fives, you know, not only here at Augusta, but also just, you know, over the past year. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I'm not going to overthink it with him. Um, I'm, I'm seeing, I know, different places between 25, 30% ownership. Um, so I'm probably going to be above that again. And, and yeah, like you said, it's going to be tricky trying to find the right players to mix and match with him. Um, and so that's where, you know, you're going to need to get a little bit creative if you're going to play him that much. <clears throat> but um, definitely starting my lineup with Scotty. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit, I don't know kind of what your thoughts are on John Rahm, but I'm a little bit, I'm going to play him because I know what he's capable of. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a little yeah. worried, though, just about, you know, the last few months, you know, like others have mentioned, playing on these resort courses, you know, the lack of urgency, you know, the competition. So, you know, he might be a really good leverage play for ownership. Uh, but my second guy up top here, I'm, I'm all in 
on Rory McIlroy this week. Um, look, his swing issues are fixed. We've we've seen the results already. He has had his best approach week in five years at the Valero last week, gaining seven and a half strokes on approach. He's gained 11.6 on approach in his last two starts. So Brad Faxon has his putting as consistent as it's ever been. Um, he has gained strokes on the greens in 14 of his last 16 starts. Um, he eats up the par fives here. So for me, and it's just kind of a matter of Rory being more disciplined and playing more conservative on the par fours and on these tougher holes. And so, you know, his major record, while he hasn't won recently, um, he still has the fourth best record in majors, you know, in this field. And so yeah. um, as far as these guys up top, I you know he's going to be my second play. Yep. I've been taking a peek at what it takes to win at Augusta, what it takes to win a major. And I think what I saw is about you have to have finished ninth in a major in the past in order to have the chance to win a another major, you know, a your first major or your next major. I think that's something that's really important when it comes to these majors and this major season. Brooks and and Rory. Rory's got 14 top nines in majors, which is incredible. And yet over the last, you know, looking at my data from 2017, there's not a single win in that column, which is kind of crazy to think about, right? So we've got all of that from Rory. And I think I'm out on Rory, Ron, because the moment's too big. I think the moment is just too big. Like statistically, I get it. I completely get it. You know, I have I see how Rory fits and I see how everyone gets lured in. Everyone's also getting caught up in that second place finish where he gained five and a half strokes around the green in the final round to finish second. You know, like that wasn't like he went in masterclass ball, struck that place to death. I think people are trying to make Rory fit you. The scar tissue is thick. It is thick, thick, thick at this venue. And I'm I'm curious to see what happens there with him. I don't, I don't know. You know, it's it's too overwhelming, in my opinion. Too overwhelming. Um, Brooks, to me, is a guy that can handle that kind of pressure. I think that's where I'll be going. I'll probably be starting the majority of my lineups there. I'm out on Scotty. I'm out on Rory, especially with this wind. You know, I think I will be playing a bit of Ram, like you mentioned. I think his ownership is going to be low. And I like Ram dealing with these tricky conditions. He thrived in that rain last year. You know, like he handled those conditions really well. So, yeah. Does Let me ask you this. Does Brooks and the putter switch and – Look, I know we all know what he does in majors, but does that does that scare you at all? Did he go? He's back to the blade this week, right? From what I've seen, no, from what I've heard, he switched and he's sticking with with the mallet. The mallet. Yep. Well, all it will take is one rough round on the on the greens, and he'll fly right back. I don't know. Maybe he maybe puts better with it. Maybe he thinks that the thing that's been missing at Augusta is the ability to take care of business on the greens the way he has taking a look at what Brooks has done on the greens at Augusta. Does he need a putter change? Yes, he does. I mean, he's gained the 47th most strokes putting in this field at Augusta. So to me, a putter change at Augusta is fine. I think the ball striking has typically followed through for Brooksy in that department. I think that's where he gets the majority of his damage done. I'm fine with the putter change. It's Brooks Kupka. This guy's got 10 top fours in majors, you know, like over the last six months, six years. So it's like really nothing I'm too concerned about. The price tag is fine. The ownership is fine. You know, all of that is perfect. Considering Brooks just def won the PJ Championship and finished second year last year, there's too much good stuff going on for Brooks for me to kind of pass up in that department. So he'll be my number one guy. I'm out on Wyndham Clark as well. I think a debut appearance... This is a good question, Ron. How many how many debutants would you put in your lineup at one time? Would you have two or is one enough? Yeah, that is a good question to think about. Like if, if well, I'm, I'm multi-entering, so um yeah, I think I think you could try to limit it to one. Um you know, I think Wyndham is just really interesting because he has the creativity to play here. Um, we've seen how good his approach game has gotten over the past year. We've seen him win at the U.S. Open on a course that's somewhat similar with all the uneven lies with the length off the tee you need at, at L.A. Country Club. Um, yeah, we've seen him kind of turn into this, this big game hunter almost. 
most. And so he's like the biggest question for me still as far as how much I'm going to play. Like, I don't know what you're seeing. I'm seeing between 8 and 10% ownership yeah. right now. Um, so, I mean, that's a really interesting thing. Um, you know, I know he, he has this confidence where he thinks he can, you know, I saw his interview yesterday. He, he thinks he's going to be perfectly fine this week. Um, so you have to love that about him that he, you know, he's coming in, you know, full of, you know, expectation. And so, um, yeah, I'm going to play him now. I wouldn't recommend playing him and Ludwig Aberg in the same lineup probably. Um, but, um, yeah, I think uh, Clark is someone who I'm going to try to at least be, um, even with the field on. Yeah. For me, I'm out on betting him. I think I will take a chance on him in a single entry for sure. I think the, the ownership on him in those contests will be even less because I think everyone's going to want to lean into that reliability of Rory and, and Ram and Scotty um, and Xander. You know, I think tons of people will be clicking Xander instead of Wyndham Clark at, and Joachim Neiman in that six in the 9K range. So there's a lot of good chalky privets to go to in that world so we can chat about that as we get into the nines the one thing about Wyndham for me at this golf course in his debut appearance is the fact that he hits this massive fade and I'm not entirely sure how he's going to deal with that on these par fives that require a draw I think he's going to have to hit three woods along with the rest of the gang you know that's why the the likes of I was just thinking about Fitz you know we can get to him in a little bit but he hits that ropey draw if you think about Chris Kirk, he hits a draw. You know, like Corey Connors is at Successia, hits that draw. It's kind of interesting how Zach Johnson hits the draw, you know, like back in the day. It's lefties and drawers of the golf ball have had Successia. And I think Wyndham hitting that massive fade is going to be very interesting in his debut appearance. I feel like he can figure out the fade as he goes along. But I think just in general, this week is going to be a, a very tough learning ground for him. I don't think he's got... The, the shot shapes to handle this golf course, especially at this price. You know, $10,000 is a lot. Um, nine, nine, Xander Shafley. In the wind, Ron, we'll have to see. I'm out on him. I wanted to bet him for a top 20 in the majors at minus 165. I've got a bet on him to finish top 20 in every single major this year at plus 850. So, I'm in on Xander's like safety in the majors. I don't know if he can win this thing. I think he's going to be chalky as all get up. If you give me conditions, I'm going to be out on Xander. We've seen it at the players. We've seen it at the Houston Open. We've seen it at API. I think, you know, like we've seen all these windy conditions. Xander kind of gets blown off the course a little bit. It's I don't have an actual track record, but that's my take on him there. And then Neiman's also just going to be far too popular. I'll be betting Neiman for like an, a top 10 to kind of just get my leverage there and my exposure. But those two popular options at the top of the nines, I'm going to be leaving alone. So I'm curious as to what you're doing at the top of the 9K range here, Ron. So, yeah, so Xander, um, getting back to the wind discussion. So on the rabbit hole, we do have a filter where you can go and look in, you know, really windy conditions, you know, 19 plus miles an hour. And um, so he's averaging um, 0.85 strokes per round in those conditions. And again, not completely accurate as we all know the wind blows at different times and for different uh, different holes it's it's obviously going to be um, not the same so take that with a grain of salt um, but yeah just overall you know we all know he's a top 20 machine when he plays in majors you know he's got seven consecutive top 18 finishes um, but but you know what I think as far as chalk goes to me he's one of the examples of good chalk this week um, and this might be the year he not only contends but he actually wins and I firmly believe that you know you know, of course, going to my trends piece, he finishes the top player. Um, 19 of the 20 trends he actually fits this year. Um, he, and he's also coming in very good form, you know, with eight top tens in his last 11 starts. So, you know, obviously from a safety perspective, um, you're not going to find anyone better. Um, so it's just a matter of almost with Rory, the same thing. Can he get over that, that mental hurdle? And can he get into that, you know, when he gets into contention on Sunday, which I think he has a great chance to, to do, can he bear down and actually turn into that Sunday killer that we need him to, to be, you know, to come up with his, with his first See, major. I don't know if he can. And I don't know if this is the one yeah, because yeah. of the wind, you know, that's the thing for me. It's the wind is going to be a big, big factor for me. And the crazy thing is, Ron, you mentioned seven consecutive top 18s, seven consecutive finishes, not better than 10th <laughs> in that run as well. You know, that's just the crazy thing with Xander. It's like, 
once the majors come up, it's he finds a safety blanket between 18th and 10th place, it seems like, in the last two years. So we'll have to see what he can do in that department. At 9-9 and probably the second or third highest owned guy in the field, I'm just going to be fading Scotty and Xander, and then I can pretty much play however I want from there. You know, I feel like if you just do that, you can play pretty much all the other course history guys as the, your combined ownership is not going to rival anyone else. That's a dangerous game, though, so you better be ready for it. Yeah, dangerous game. So the reason for Scotty fade, the price. The reason for the Xander fade, the weather. You know, I'll take those two chances on them, and the rest of the gang I'll throw in there. So we'll see what we can do. I'll be playing some Victor Hovland as just going to the fact that he's played fantastically in majors. The guy's gained the eighth most total strokes in majors since 2017. He's a ball striking beast in these big tournaments. He steps it up into another gear, you know, and, and I know he's playing like complete garbage right now. Their ownership is likely going to be reflecting that. I don't know what you're seeing for ownership on Victor, Ron, but we're going to get a, a sub 10% Victor Hovland at Augusta. You know, to me, that's hard to pass up. I'll throw him in a, a lineup or two and see where he takes me. I think that's a good, good option as a leverage play because, like you mentioned, you're going to have to play the guys that play well at Augusta. Chalk is going to be a thing this week. You have to take that on. Finding ways to kind of differentiate yourself and get that 5%er, the 2%er guy in there somehow in an 89 man field is going to be the way to win these tournaments this week. So, trying to find some options like that is going to be very important. My favorite play in this range run and will likely be in a lot of my different lineups is Will Zalatoris. At $9,200, you can't tell me that one of the greatest major golfers of this decade you know like he's got 33 rounds of golf and nobody has gained more strokes in majors than will zalatoris in those 33 rounds of golf that he's played in one of them the reason for the odd number he had a withdrawal from the open championship um, and was playing well in that too also will zalatoris has putted incredibly well at augusta he's like second in putting at augusta in his eight rounds of golf behind justin rose i think willie z has shown us that he can play the golf we're looking for him to do We've had fantastic finishes at the Genesis, at the Farmers, at API, all venues that are big boy tracks that have these kind of same layouts as Augusta. I think that's something that you really need to look into. I'm fine with the fact that he completely forgot how to putt the last two weeks. I think he'll be just fine on his Augusta greens. And then I'll be fading Ludwig because he's a debutante. And if you take a look, Ron, at his... Best finishes on the PGA Tour, they're all on these short courses. The RSM, Pebble Beach, the John Deere Classic. they all these venues where you can kind of, the players, you know, those are his top, four of his top, four of his five top tens on the PGA Tour have come on courses shorter than 7,300 yards. So now we go to 75.55 at Augusta, first major, debut appearance. You know, it, I've got reason to back these guys and I've got reason to fade them. So I'm out on Ludwig. I'll be playing a decky. I'll be playing Willie Z either side of him. Yeah, this is a really tough range to try to kind of separate guys out. You know, you could, I mean, even going up to Joaquin Neiman, you know, I love how his form and, you know, his draw plays well here. And there's so many good things you could say about him, even with him being on the live and, you know, not knowing exactly the competition, you know, we, we talked about that uh, many times, but I just can't, get to him at 9,600. If he was 9K or under, where I think, you know, I'd be more comfortable. So I'm passing on Neiman. I agree with you on Victor. You know, he's the eighth best player in this field in majors, seventh here last year. Uh, and when you look at his around the green game, which, you know, when you look at recently, it's, it looks like it's taken a pretty big step backwards when he's lost strokes in his last five rounds, losing almost seven strokes around the green at the players. Yeah. Um, if you look at him at Augusta, though, he's pretty much even in his – 16 career rounds around the green. So my hope is that he has enough memory here um, and kind of what he's been through in the past is enough to get him through. So I think you're getting a tremendous value on him with only eight, 9% ownership. Um, and just going down the rest of this area, like Jordan Spieth. Okay. So this guy, he misses back to back cuts at the players in Valspar. He's hitting it all over the place. Then he has these wrist injury concerns, which, you know, got brought up again this week. And then he goes last week and he gains 9.1 strokes ball striking and he just draws you right back in again. And look what week it is. You know, this is his happy place. He's got six top four finishes here. 
Um, obviously, we all know about the creativity around the greens, his shot shaping. Um, and so I'm, like I said, I'm drawn back in. I'm playing a lot of speed this week. Um, you said a lot of good things about Will Zalatoris. You know, he's the ultimate big game hunter. You know, I did. I put on on the uh, on the rabbit hole a little graphic where if you look at majors in the last five years, he is the top player at 2.78 strokes gained per round. Scotty Scheffler is second at 246. So, I mean, that's all you need to see right there. We're talking yeah. six top eight finishes. And I'm not really worried. I know some people have brought this up. I'm not really worried about his last two weeks, one little bit, because he showed me all I needed to see. 13th at Farmers, second at Genesis, fourth at API. You know, he's the fifth best in this field in par fives. As for his putting, okay, Byron, are you ready for this? I'm listening, baby. Hit me. In his two, his two trips here to Augusta, he's gained 10 and a half strokes putting on these greens. Yeah. So, you know, I'm really, you know, I'm really not worried at all. I think he's going to have a great week. Um, I've got an outright on him. I, I it, For some reason, I don't understand why the odds are dropping, but I got him. 25 to 1? One. Um, Aberg is another big question mark because he's a guy like, okay, so the course history, he's never played here. Obviously, that's a concern, but – He's proven like he's seeing all these PGA courses for the first time and he's just racking up consistent top 10, top 15, one after another. So, again, we all know this is a bombers course where if you hit it long and straight and you have a high apex going into these greens, you're going to have an advantage. And so I think he is someone who it's going to be really hard for me to fade. And so it's just a matter of how much am I going to play him? I do see his ownership kind of um, 13, 15 percent. So that's going to be interesting. Um I'll conclude with Hideki, like one of the biggest misprices on this board. Um, with, with his combination of current form and master's history, um, when you look at he's gained second to Scheffler, last four starts, he's gained 38 strokes tee to green. And so, you know, his weaknesses, you know, his driver is really not going to get in, him into that much trouble here. He's the best around the green player in the world, in my opinion. And yes, facts. He, He's been an average putter on these greens in his history here, and that's all he needs to be. So um, this this bottom 9K range is just really stacked and loaded, and um, it's going to be fun to try to mix and match some of these guys. And, and you could even – I think you could legitimately start lineups here where you go Speed, Zalatoris, Matsuyama. Uh, and I think you could feel really good about that. Yes, and that's, that way you're starting in the nines, you're getting – Jordan Spieth, Masters winner. Will Zalatoris, second place finishes in his debut. Will uh, Hideki Matsuyama uh, won it three years ago. Cam Smith. If you just start with 93, 92, you know, like Cam Smith's track record is incredible, you know, and he was doing it before he was even a good golfer. I was taking a peek, you know, like he had a second and a fourth or a fifth at Augusta prior to 2021 when he kind of just became one of the world's best. He was getting like half a stroke per round on the field, you know, leading up to the 2021 like rocket year and still playing amazing golf at Augusta, you know, like when he was old Cam. Now I feel like we've got Cam that's kind of in, in between Cam that won me the shirt, you know, at the Open Championship or Cam that's playing live right now and sucking it up, you know, looking like Oppenheimer there with uh, Eclipse glasses on playing golf out. You know, like, what are we doing, bro? Just, like, take the week off if you, like, got your sunglasses. It looks like you're going to experience a solar flare on your first tee shot. But at this golf course, in, in these kind of conditions as well, I feel like that might help Cam a little bit because you can chip and putt your way around this venue. You know, I think no one can do it better here than Cam. But I was taking a look at what he gets up to at Augusta, and he's actually – it's the irons for Cam at this golf course. He's not necessarily – that's the best trait for him. He's really good with his irons at this golf course. So we'll see what he can do. I'm in. We're going to get another guy that if by the end of the week, Cam Smith is fifth or third, you wouldn't be surprised, but we're getting like 8% ownership on this dude. You know, I understand the course, the recent form has been rough. I understand, you know, he, he WD'd with the lives, uh, food poisoning, but this price and, and this ownership run, what are we doing with Cam Smith at eight nine? So I'm out on Cam Smith. Um, you oh, mentioned no. a lot of the reasons why. You know, just with the recent, you know, even looking at, I know the live data. You know, there's questions about how accurate it really is. But when you look at his um, ball striking, you know, he's losing almost three quarters of a shot per round in the 
13 rounds that he's played this year. Um, he's always going to be good with the short game. That, that's never going to leave, and that's going to definitely be beneficial here. Um, I just don't know, and he's one of the guys who, since he's moved to live, I don't know. I think I think the move for him is is something where it's been more negative than positive yeah. as far as for his game. You know, I think that lack of consistent, intense competition, um, I think that kind of weighs on me as far as playing him this week. And I, I, I do think he has a decent price. Um, I'm out on DJ. Uh, I don't think DJ is anywhere near the same player he was even five years ago. Yeah. Uh, for me, and, and this is where it gets interesting because this is the range where you start to get to a lot of these guys who are not in great form. And so I think this is where if you're playing, you know, the millionaire lineup, this millionaire lineups this week, um, this is where it's going to be one or loss in my opinion, because you have, you know, you have Justin Thomas sitting there at eight, seven, you keep going down, you got more you got Max Homa, you got Sam Burns, who's never played well in majors. Um, so a lot of interesting choices here at really low ownership. Um, I'm going to JT again this week. You know, I know he's had the caddy switch um, and I know, there's been times, and of course, this is all anecdotal evidence, but whenever you have a big switch, even in pro sports or college sports, you know, you get a coaching change Coach and there's someone new that comes in. Usually you get, you know, a bump in that first week or two. And so, you know, I think JT, especially with the windy conditions on Thursday and Friday, um, you know, his history, you know, obviously he missed the cut, did not play well here last year, but, you know, he's had a couple top tens in the last three years. So for me, I'm going to be in on JT at, um, I don't know what you're seeing. I'm seeing seven, 8% right now. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Tony, Fino, right below him. windy, like windy yep. Yep. first two days, JT let's go. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, just looking at that exact number. So he's gaining 1.4 strokes per round in windy conditions, which is top 10 yeah. in this field. Um, and yeah, but Tony Fino right below him. Um, you know, it seems like Tony unlocks something with his driver and I know, he made a recent change there, but, you know, he gained over eight strokes ball striking last week, finishing, you know, second in Houston. Um, or that was two weeks ago. Uh, but he's a very consistent performer here at Augusta. Three top tens. I think he's a really safe play. Don't necessarily think he's going to win, but, I mean, you'll take a top ten, you know, at 8.6 here. And then Cam Young right below him, you know, <clears throat> I know he's going to be popular. You know, coming in with – Excellent tee to green for him. You know, he's got three top eights in the last two months. Kind of similar to Zalatoris. You know, he's seventh best in majors in this field at 1.82 strokes per round. Uh, he's got four top eights in majors in the last two years. Another good par five guy. And again, you're going to have to feast on the par fives in this course. The intriguing thing to me with Cam Young is his spike putting potential. So if you look at his recent starts, He's got some really bad putting performances in there that have dragged him down. But when you look at the weeks he spiked, uh, 2.4 at Velspar, 3.9 at Cognizant, 5.2 at Phoenix. And then if you go back to last year at the BMW, he gained 7.4 strokes putting that week. So at 8.5 with that ability and his all-around game, when you look at off the tee on approach, um, I really love Cam Young this week. And – I'll just do. I'll just go my last favorite play here at the bottom of the AK, and I'll give it back to you. But um, say it together, Ron. One, two, three. Shane Lowry. Shane Lowry. There we go. So, yeah, great form. Um, when you look at T to Green, he's gained twenty-four strokes over his last four. He's one of the top players coming in the field. Um, he's got four straight twenty top twenty-fives here at Augusta. He was third in twenty twenty-two, and he's another guy that uh, he should thrive in these windy conditions uh, the first two days. So. I really like Shane Lowry at 8K flat. Yep. I bet Shane Lowry for a top 20. You know me and Shane Lowry. We go way back and it's not good. So for me to be on him this week, let you know that I'm a big fan of him at Augusta. The same goes for Hideki. Got him for a top 20. Ron, eight recent starts at the Masters for Hideki and he's finished inside the top 27 times. What are yeah. we doing? You know, like that's just incredible. Like it's, I think it's even eight of nine. Uh, it's one of those two numbers, but a really, really incredible situation for a decky. I, I don't know what's, what's going on. Yeah, it's eight of nine for him, which is really incredible. Cameron Young, masters, majors, guy knows what he's doing. It's really, really impressive to see him play some good golf in these environments. He's due. 
You know, I think when the rain came through last year, he lost one and a half strokes on the field and still finished, I think, top 10. You know, I think if he can avoid playing really badly, he finished seventh. If you can avoid playing really badly in the rain for Cam Young, that's going to be the most important part for him. We know what he can do in these majors. Tony Finau gained the most strokes off the tee this year outside of Pebble Beach, where they only played on that venue twice. So that was encouraging, you know, at, at the Houston Open. After he, he changed his driver shaft, he got fitted. A PGA professional inside the top 20 or two-time winner on the PGA Tour had the wrong shaft in his driver. Like, it's 2024, and Tony Finau's walking around with a shaft that's as flimsy as, you know, Will Zalatoris on a five-footer in a regular PGA Tour event. It's I don't understand what's going on, so I'm glad they fixed that for Tony. I'm all in on him there too. And like you mentioned with Justin Thomas, I'm in on JT with the, the caddy change. It's palatable. You know, you can see that stuff happening and we get that wind again. I'm out on the other guys that you also didn't mention because of various reasons. Colin Marikawa's iron game has completely gone off the boil. And the fact that, you know, that needs to be his best trait, not necessarily being there anymore for him is a problem. Matthew Fitzpatrick, Ron, $7,900, has gained the second most strokes off the tee around Augusta. What does he do? Hits that little ropey draw. I love that about Fitz. Fitz has now a 10th and a 13th in his last two appearances at Augusta. He actually also had a 7th, I think, in his debut appearance or his second appearance here. So he's played nicely, but not necessarily as high up as you'd expect for Fitzy. This price is a problem. What is the U.S. Open champion from 2022 doing at $7,900 when the guys had three top 20s in his last five starts? There's too much to like about Fitz. All of the stuff he did last year from the three years of shot link data, putted the best he's ever putted at Augusta last year. Hit his irons the best he's ever hit his irons at Augusta last year. And we know how well he can drive it. So for someone that's really sharp around the greens, he's actually struggled around here, which is kind of fascinating. So that's the only issue for me, but at $7,900, it's a full send. Got him top 20, bet him outright. I'm balls to the wall on Fitz this week. Yeah, that, that price is almost criminal. Like, look, so since he since he fixed the driver, so he had this this four gram weight in his driver, it lost track of it. And ever since he took it out, so he's finished fifth at the players, and then last week he's 10th at Valero. Um, looked really good all around. Uh, you know, he's an excellent par five score. He's the sixth best in the sixth best in this field. Um, he's the best scrambler on tight lies. And so when we when we're looking at courses similar to Augusta, and again, there's not many that are similar because of how tough it is. Uh, but you know, on similar courses, he's the best player around the greens. Um, you know, he just in general, he thrives on tough courses. You know, when you go back to his U S open, uh, victory, um, and like Shane Lowry, he is another elite player in the wind. And so uh, Fitzpatrick is probably, not probably, he's for sure one of my core plays this week. Um, I know, you know, we're seeing uh, right around 18, 19 ownership. And so that's a little bit of a concern, but I'll, I'll put him in the same bucket for me as, as Xander. He's, he's going to be good chalk this week, and I will attempt to differentiate around him. Uh, my other favorite play up here and you know i do like Figala. i think i think his ownership is getting close to that point where you know you might have to take a little step back here uh, but for me um and this is going to be a lone play and a guy who is not in good form uh but sung jm seven six sneaky play and it's almost based on course history alone here yeah, you know exactly he's got three top Three top 16s, um, and at this price, you can get away with basing it on something as just course history alone. And so, um, you know, I'm 5% ownership, and so, you know, it's a little scary because of, you know, his ball striking, especially on approach, has not been good. But uh, he's a guy I'm willing to take a chance on and try to gain some leverage down here. Dude, dude, I think that's the first time I've ever called you dude, Ron. Um, that's fine. Sorry if you hate being called dude, but uh, – Dude, Sung J M wasn't playing very well when he was going to API, 18th place. You know, like we're seeing a bit of stuff where he goes back to these golf courses, he finds that groove a touch. Sung has never really been the greatest when it comes to majors. I think there's a lot to do with the fact that you know the the military service for him and Siwoo 
we've seen Siwu snap his putter on on a green not so far from behind you there on and it was quite hilarious but now that they won the asia games gold medal they don't have to do the military service anymore so i've said it a few times already this week where the two worst situations to try to win the green jacket is to try to win the green jacket as a armor plated jacket to avoid military service for the two koreans and then to win the green jacket to become what the sixth guy in history to win the grand slam which is what Rory McIlroy is trying to do with the Masters, to hang with Gary, to hang with Jack, with Tiger, Gene Saracen. You know, I think those are all guys that it's too much to overcome. So now Sanjay and, and Siwoo are, are done with that. You know, that, that like allure is no longer there. The pressure to succeed at this venue, not there. Sanjay has played really well at Augusta. You know, it's crazy to think how well he's played here. And we're getting him at $7,600 and low ownership because he's playing like crap going into the week. So I'm in on him. I'm in on Sahith because the reason I faded Xander and Scotty is because I want to play guys like Sahith. I want to play guys like Fitz, Shane Lowry. You know, like if I put those three guys in the same lineup and I've my core around Xander and Scotty, that lineup is too crazy. You know, like if I'm going with lesser guys at the top there, we are still very good options. I feel like I can get a little more chalky in this range, which I will be doing. Corey Connors is always fascinating to me, Ron. He's going to be fun to watch. I'll be playing Tom Kim. I, I know he's. it doesn't look like he's going to play good golf at all, but that little dude, he is a fighter, and I feel like he's going to find himself winning a major championship soon. We got a second place finish in a major, which to me, in order to win the Masters, you have to have finished second in a major, and Tom Kim has now done that. Not that he's going to win it this week, but it shows you that he's got some major potential. The same with Patrick Reed. I think at the $7,400 price tag, if you take a look what he's got up to at Augusta, fourth year last year, eighth and tenth, not worse than 36th in the last five years. I mean, too much good stuff from Reed. I think everyone hates him, so his ownership's typically deflated to a degree anyway. It's beautiful. He's the perfect DFS play if you can stomach it, right? So love Reed. And then Russell Henley. What on earth his game has transformed into, I can't tell you, but it's turned the guy into a baller. It's it's quite fascinating. He's got two fourth place finishes in his two of his last three starts for Russell Henley. And guess what? He finished fourth year at the Masters last year. So Russell Henley really finding himself like in the the convergence of recent history, recent form. And whether or not his irons show up again, who the heck knows? But we know this guy's a short game savant, and that's what matters around Augusta. So Talk to me, Ron. 7K range, lots of fun names in here. I'm excited. This this range has got me like way more excited than any other range, which is kind of kind of exciting with Sahith in there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, when you're looking at 7.5 going down to the bottom of this the 7K range, like I see a lot of safety here. So I think each of these guys are really good anchors for your lineup. So like a Corey Connors, T to Green Machine, uh, he's one of the one of the 10 guys who's gaining over 18. Um, in that 18 strokes in that area in his last four. So, you know, three top tens here. Um, so I think Corey Connors is just a, just a, if you're playing cash games, which I, I never do in PGA, uh, but I think he's just so safe. Um, you know, you can look at almost Tommy Fleetwood's the same way, you know, seventh last week, you know, he's made the cut here in six of his last seven trips. He's got three top twenties. Of course, we know Tommy's never going to win in the States, but you know, if you're looking for safety, you know, a guy who's going to make the cut, who can play in difficult weather conditions, which he's, you know, he's done many times in the past. Um, I gotta love him. Yeah. Patrick Reed, you know, one thing you can always count on with him, actually two things. So his performance <laughs> majors. Okay. That's one. So he's made the cut in 17 of his last 18 majors. And then the second thing is like you said, because, because people hate him, his ownership is always way lower than it should be. And so I always take advantage of that every single major. And, you know, he was fourth here last year, you know, so, the whole live discussion about, you know, these these guys aren't going to come here and play well. You know, we see that we saw a bunch of them play well last year, and Patrick Reed was one of them. And, again, that just kind of goes back to it doesn't matter what what tour you're playing on. It doesn't matter if you you take five years off. Some of these guys can just walk into Augusta National, and they can shoot a 68. And so, you know, you throw in that Patrick Reed is one of the elite scramblers in the world, especially on tight, tricky lives. Um, so I love Patrick Reed this week. Um especially at the ownership I'm seeing for him. And then, yeah, Russell Henley, 
in my opinion, you know, as even as bad as Fitz is priced and Matsuyama, I think Henley might be the ultimate misprice. And, and again, you notice a pattern of what I'm looking for this week. So it's kind of like a marriage of form and Masters history. And Henley has everything. So he's got the 10th best course history in this field. He was fourth here last year. And then looking at his current form, he's got two top fours in his last three starts. Now, he gained eight strokes on approach last week in Texas. And so he's kind of turned into, and we've talked about it on this show, where it's like his putting and his around the green play has flipped and like almost been way better than his ball striking. But then you see now his ball striking is improving. And so it's like this, this guy sitting here at 7-2 who has this all-around game. And, you know, I think he can finish top five this week, maybe even win. I do have I have 110 to one on him uh, before his his price um, really got a lot higher. And so um, I'm really going to be playing him a lot this week in DFS. Um, and then I'll conclude with Siwoo Kim in this range. So he's another guy who's entering with great tee to green, green form um, in his last. Uh, let me see here. So he's another uh, I got him ranked 12th in par fives which, uh, as we all know, is key this week. So, you know, I think this is another great price on a guy who, you know, has really turned into a consistent performer. Um, and so, um, yeah, there's – once you get below 7-1, um, you know, you've got some interesting names. You know, Steven Yeager, who's never played here before. Um, you know, we see Phil sitting there at 7K, who I am not – I'm going to bank on him not repeating what he did, um, you know, last year. Um, but uh, I think Siwu Kim is, is probably my one of my last favorite plays as we get kind of into the 6K range here. Yeah, but just to kind of highlight the difficulty of, you know, starting with a Xander or a Scotty. If you do with those two, whether you have both in your lineup or just one, if you want to play Russell Henley and Siwu Kim, you're already sitting at, at 75% total ownership you know, yeah. or or 70% ownership. It's going to be difficult to get different if you're starting with those big names up top. And you can't, you you know, you're going to, you can stack Henley and, and Siwoo if you want, mix him in with the Sith, but then you got to figure out ways to get different. You know, like I think there's too many popular names in this range, especially in the 7K range where everyone that's clicking Scotty Scheffler is going to be clicking. So you're going to click a Scotty, you're going to go to a, a a Sahith, you're going to go to a Russell Henley. I think those are two very popular names that are going to find themselves in those, those Scheffler lineups. So if you play a Scheffler, maybe try find a Patrick Reed or a, or someone to kind of mix in there to kind of get yourself different. Yeah, I've got some I've got some 6K names that I will be using, so I cool. know they're going to be a little different. So we'll see if we have any similar ones here. Yeah. So I'm seeing Tom Kim at 3%, just by the way. I mean, to me... You never know. You know, he can battle, he can gut it out and finish up there. I'm I'm in on that for sure. Um, we've got Akshay and Steven Yeager at 72 71, both making debut appearances. Akshay plus 200 to be top debutante, I believe. And then Steven Yeager is 14 to 1. I might check on the Akshay number, but it's ridiculously shorter than the rest of the gang. The hype is there. You know, there's tons of ball striking potential coming into the week. He's just won a tournament. Do you think he's really going to roll through on his debut appearance after winning a tournament the week before, messing up his shoulder and play well at Augusta? You know, he's a lefty. I get it. But he, the hype is through the through the roof right now for Akshay, right, Ron? Like, I think, what is his ownership right now that you're seeing? I'm seeing... A 7%, which isn't as bad, but I think as a late addition, the hype is going to start catching up. Yeah, I'm seeing 8%. And yeah. like for all the reasons you mentioned, um, I have a miscut bet on him at plus 192. Ooh. Yeah, I went that way with him. Um, so, yeah, and, and just I just like so many other better plays, you know, yeah. in, that, in this range. And so I'm, I'm going to be out on actually. Cool. I am in. So I'm in on being out on Akshay. Before we get out of the sevens, Phil Mickelson, minus 120 to beat Fred Couples, Jose Maria Alavabal, Vijay Singh, and Mike Weir as the top senior. Minus 120. Phil Mickelson has as many top 25s as those three have combined made cuts in the last five years. He's minus 120 against them all. Just your friendly, fun 
maniac information there. Charles Schwartzel, Ron. I think I'm going to be playing him in a lot of lineups. I think I'm going to be playing Zach Johnson in a lot of lineups. If you give me these nasty, all I need at 6,100 bucks is for Zach to make the cut. The weather conditions seem perfect for Zach to make the cut. This is what Zach, he, he lives to play golf in tough conditions. He doesn't live to become the Ryder Cup U.S. captain. Yes, he did do that as well, but you know we're not all meant for certain roles. His role for me is $6,100 DFS option at Augusta in open championship conditions to start off with. So give me him. Let's see what he can do. I'll be floating Gary Woodland through my rotation in the bottom here for sure. Those are the guys I'll be looking at along with the likes of a Chris Kirk who has done some really nice things at Augusta in his limited span here. And then Arson Eckroad is going to be my guy at $6,300 as a debutante. I'm kind of picking and choosing my battles with these guys. I'm not going all in on any of them outside of Eckroad and Jaeger and if maybe one or two others up top. But Eckroad at 22 to 1 at ESPN to be the top debutante. If you take a look at what Eckroad's situation is, he's so freaking good on these long iron shots. From 150 and out, there's hardly much better than him. On a good shot basis, there's only three other golfers in this field that hit more good shots from a weighted perspective. You know, for Augusta, only three other guys are better at hitting good shots with the long irons. He's also top 10 at avoiding poor shots. Austin Ecker at $6,300. His irons are dialed. He hits it a decent amount. Let's see what he can do at Augusta in his debut. Those are my guys in this range, along with some Emiliano Grio. Not a lot going on for me in the sixes. That's why I'm liking this balanced build approach. All right, so I got three guys for you that I will – kind of my favorites down here that I – and I agree with you. Once you get down here, you probably don't want to be spraying more than 5%, 10%, just kind of mixing, matching. But I agree on Chris Kirk. You know, he finished 35th overall in my model this week. You know, 17th around the green. Uh, recent form has been good. And he tends to play – very well on difficult tracks you know when you look at birdie or better and also bogey avoidance on difficult courses uh he's top 30 in this field in both of those um and so yeah he's got a pretty decent performance here at augusta um so i love him um it's i'm a, going down it's to benny a ropey on. draw ropey draw baby. it is yeah, yeah. Uh, i think benny on um with you know i know he's had a couple uh recent hiccups here uh but i think his overall game that he's shown so far in 2024, um, you know, hasn't had the best history here, but he's a guy who I think has got some upside. Uh, we all know how good he is around the green. Um, and, and just that combined with his recent form, he also has the highest apex uh, ball flight. And so again, getting into those, you know, we'll see how, we'll see how firm the greens get, you know, with the rain coming tomorrow. Uh, but I think that's an advantage. Um, and I think he, the greens. Yep. And uh, Keegan Bradley, I think he's another guy who easily could have been in the 7K range. <clears throat> so to get him at 6,700, um, you know, again, a guy who's played here a bunch. And, you know, the data shows that, guys, the more you play here, even a guy like Bradley who's played here, you know, seven, eight times, um, you know, I, I think he's got the consistency and the upside um, to kind of anchor, you know, your, your lineup here in, in this range. And so – I love Bradley. Um, and then a couple other interesting names, you know, Ryan Fox, you know, I'm not playing him. He's probably going to be one of my 5% guys. But, again, he finished 26th here in his debut last year. Um, he's a guy who I think has played in these conditions, and he's played in, a, a, I think, around seven, eight majors now and has had some pretty decent results. Yeah. Um, and then a, kind, of a, kind of a dart throw, 6,700, Nikolai Hoygaard, another guy who was – playing so well and then recently he's kind of fell off the map but he's also has that draw and i think that's going to play well here and <clears throat> again he's played in, in a lot of tournaments you know in the past year um on tough courses you know whether it's it's overseas on the dp world tour before he came over here yeah. um so i think his overall talent level um when we get down here is, is enough for me to play him um and i will conclude with um denny mccarthy sitting there 6200 um, he is, as we all know, one of the best putters, perhaps the best putter in this field. Uh, but his around the green play, um, we saw his irons are surprisingly much improved. Um, and so, you know, he's he's also commented above that he loves tough courses and he loves tough conditions. And um, I think for what we just saw, 
you know him, him do on the weekend uh, at the Valero. Um, I think this is a steal of a price if you want to take some chances with him down here at sixty two hundred. Yeah, that yeah, I th I will add him to my player pool then at sixty two hundred dollars. That's ridiculous. Is his debut, I believe, at Augusta, or at least hasn't played yet in the last five years. But like you've like you've mentioned, Ron, he likes to play well in these majors. He's actually got the second best putting stats in majors for me, and he's played in twenty six rounds of major golf, which is a decent amount. You know, I'll take a two dozen rounds and having it still shows that his putter shows up in these in these events, which is good. You know, I think you probably find yourself over a lot more fifteen footers in a major than you do at a typical PGA Tour event, you know, for par and things like that. Let me say one more name really quick. I almost forgot about him. 6,400. Okay. So Taylor Moore has not missed a cut in over nine months. So he's turned into this just consistent performer. Uh, and he did play here last year where he finished in the top 40. So there's something else, you know, to go on with him. Um, and so I think uh, he's another guy who I will definitely have some. Yeah. $6,400 golfer just going to get you across the line. That's all we're looking for. I think I have him for a top 40 bet as well in my every bet article. Um, awesome stuff, Ron. I guess we missed the 6K draft. I got a little carried away once I got in there after getting all excited about the sevens. But who's your favorite favorite play in the sixes? If I had to pick one, um, I'll probably go Keegan Bradley. You know, I think, I think he has the... Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go Bradley. Okay, Bradley. I'm going to go Woodland. Gary Woodland. I don't know if I even mentioned him in my my spiel, but the guy's ball striking it right now. And when you get to majors, his short game fixes itself up. It gets like neutral versus bad. Carry distance. One of the best carry distance players too off the tee. Yeah. Tons and tons of distance, dude. He's been really, really playing nicely when it comes to that situation. So... Lots to be desired, lots to be admired. We are looking forward to an awesome week of the Moss. It Ron, it's it's two fifteen in Iowa right now. I've got two more hours. I'm gonna log back into my laptop here, yeah, and then I'm done working for the week. I'm gonna sit back and watch Augusta. So, what's your favorite hole, Ron? I know. Let's chat about. Let's just chat about Augusta if you have a few minutes. I wanna just get your takes on on this beautiful golf course and a and a venue and a an event that we kind of base our lives around you know like this is the tournament that my buddy austin will watch once a year yeah i mean man where do you start with that i think i think i would probably say to a little bit just amen corner in general sure you know um you know where, where, where you see the beauty and you know just the scenery and it looks like it's out of a movie like and that's one of the things with being able to go one day is just you know you see it on tv and it looks absolutely perfect and i mean i've heard you know, it looks even better in person. And so, um, you know, those three holes, you know, 11 through 13 are among the most exciting in golf and just the risk reward on those three holes, you know, as, as you're coming down the, before you come down the stretch. Um, and so that back nine is, is just really exciting to me. It is so much fun. You know, obviously 12 is tons of fun. I love the two back nine par fives, you know, they are still very risk reward. I hope they find, you know, the two, two of them where we we give the guys the chance to go for it but it needs to be at a very on that perfect precipice you know of making sure that they they take on that risk just enough i think that's going to be a lot of fun to watch this week i think what one of the holes the dog leg around i think 13 um they kind of figured out they moved the tee box back again one of the par fives so um we'll have to see how that that works out but i think it's going to be a fun week, man. Um, what is your favorite random Masters bet to make, Ron? You duck bet degenerately during the Masters, or do you kind of still keep it tight? No, I'm 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 trying to keep discipline here. Um, look, I took I took Tiger uh, when he was, I think, a couple of days ago, when he was plus one twenty to make the cut. Um, I think when you're looking at a streak like that, like what 24, 25 straight years. Yeah. Um, and all reports are that he is, you know, he's hitting it pretty well. And so I think if he can just get through those first two days and he doesn't withdraw, obviously he'll make the cut if he does that. But um, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to take the risk of actually playing him in, in my DraftKings lineups, but um, yeah, I'll definitely be rooting for him to make that cut. And I, I think that's a pretty good value at plus 120. Yeah, I agree. 
Um, I also have that as my suggested bet for him. I have a 14 to 1 Freddie Couples top 20 after round one. It's possible. Why the hell not? You know, like yeah. if if he out of all of them, I think all of the old dogs, he's still got that length, he's still got that ability just for round one because he, he can't hang, you know, for four straight. But he can definitely party, show up, shotgun a few beers, make make the party a fun time in round one, and then kind of fizzle away as his back gives out over the week. So lots and lots of fun to be had this week, folks. Thank you all for tuning in. Don't forget to go check out the rabbit hole over there at bedspurtsgolf.com. Um, message Ron if you're looking for a promo code that you can't have as a vivid vivid seats. Um subscriber there which ends at the end of this month so awesome awesome stuff it's the masses let's enjoy guys bet responsibly bet too much do whatever you need to do there make sure that you hide it all from your wife and let's have a week where we pivot our faces off